Hello everyone, my name is Flair Blitz and we've returned back to our adventures of Historia. Will the Serpent Peace return once more? Peace? Beast. And um, will Natani be even more worried about us and Michelli? Sitting in the silence of the darkened car is uncomfortable, but somehow I feel that talking to Michelli would be even more so. Natani's impassioned, impassioned pleas ring heavy in my ears. Perhaps she's right. She's? Where's my head at today? And Michelli is a dangerous person. But until the serpent is dead, she's my only ally. After this is done, one way or the other will part ways. I'll go back to my studies, graduate, and find some nice university on the other side of the country. Maybe get a night shift job to have some spending money. Party away the memories of supernatural beings. Sounds nice, if it were true. Deep inside me, I can see a future where I do nothing but fight this snake until I die, or it dies. Every night, charge into battle with an immortal enemy, until finally it gets the upper hand on me and I disappear from history, or it disappears from history. Whichever way, who knows? It's a depressing thought. Oh dear. You're not yawning, are you? What? No, just thinking. About what? Think about nothing. Of course! The future, I guess. Michelle's eyes narrow. There is no future while that thing is around. In a way, she's right. The serpent is like a boulder sitting on the train track of my life. Before we met, I was cruising along a pretty well-defined path. Until Machete came along. Now, until, until it is cleared from the tracks, I'm going nowhere. True that. Silence descends upon us again, and our gazes stare out across the small patch of the town. I can see the lights in the house extinguished one by one as people tuck themselves into bed. The subtle blue glow of TV sets in the darkened rooms. I think about the lives being lived in there. The kids in my class are probably still awake, studying. The elderly already fast asleep. How many couples are out there before me, losing themselves in each other's bodies? Okay, let's move on. And yet here we are, a couple of kids watching over a town that doesn't even know it needs protecting. Why couldn't this have happened to anyone else? Sorry, anyone else. But more importantly, why did this have to happen in the first place? There, or? The Chinese shrill voice tears through the air. See it? I squint through the windshield trying to follow her outstretched finger. I don't really... Where? Who cares if you can see it? Let's go. But where though? The Jenny's orders run directly to my brain before I know it. I'm turning over the ignition driving mindlessly. Where to? Down by the river near the parkway. Move it. I aim the car towards the town and head down the hill. Out of the corner of my eye, I think I can see where, what Machetti sees. A spear of multicolored light bursting from the windows of a house. Flashback of Max's house replay through my mind, but I force them from my consciousness. I see it! Machetti unclips her seatbelt and chambers into the back seat. Okay, what are you doing? Preparations, you drive, let me deal with this. I see a slender frame reach over the back seat of the car in my rear view mirror, but I can't see what she is doing exactly. All I can hear is her grunting and sweating under her breath and the thick smell of kerosene. <laughs> it would appear she's graduated from turpentine. Thankfully, the nighttime streets are empty, allowing me to speed through the town towards the parkway. Did you know there was two young people in a car that was driving madlessly? So mindlessly throughout the night? Madly? My old builds in my stomach and I taste ozone over petrochemical smells Machetti's producing in the back of a car. Well, the right track. I push through the sensation and take the turn into a parkway a little too fast. Watch it, idiot! Machetti curses her body slams against the side of the car. Sorry, I wasn't getting there as fast as possible. Are you ready? You bet I am. The raising sensation in my gut reaches a crescendo as I see the house appear before me. It's a three-story house, and the serpent's technicolor aura is pouring from every window. Leave this to me. Machete tears open the car's rear door before I can even stop the vehicle. She's carrying some contraption made of pipes and tubing, and which is a faint glow. 
around which is a faint glow. Sorry, you can't be serious. I rip up the car's handbrake and charge out after Michelli, but I'm too far behind her to stop. Okay. She has already entered the house. I can feel myself enter the surface bubble and time seems to freeze. Oh my gosh, this is loud. I plunge into the gut-wrenching blackness of the house. Whatever Michelli is carrying casts flickering orange shadows around the entranceway. Well, it's a flamethrower source. Oh my gosh. It definitely is a flamethrower. <laughs> Come on out, Blink. Instantly, the hallway is filled with strobing colorful lights and the serpent's head punches through the wall. Oh dear. Michelli throws a lever of a contraption. A plume of flame and smoke erupts from a makeshift flamethrower. The bright orange light challenges the serpent's own glow for dominance in the small space. An ungodly sound tears through the house as the flames lick over the serpent's body. And it recalls through the wall from whence it came. This is a horrifying beast. Smoke alarms instantly add to the noise with their shrill cry. Puddles of fuel still flaming line the hallway. I can feel the effect of a serpent's eyes that slip away like a bubble collapsing in on itself. Die! Oh, Vichelli opens up her flamethrower again, drenching the hallways in flames and fuel. But I know the serpent has already left, and history has rewrite itself as we speak. Exactly! The poor victims that are now... Well, who were the victims? We need to go. Never! I'm going to kill this thing tonight! The smell of ozone disappears and my stomach begins to settle, but still the flames begin to grow. There is a subtle patch in the turn of the fire alarms as the bubble finally collapses, leaving us alone in reality. Michelli, it's gone! You're burning down the new house! I can't get through to her. I rush forward and feel the intense heat from the fire against my bare face. The smell is awful. Kerosene mixed with a nauseating smell of burnt hair and carpet. I gag at a combination of odors. As I reach Michelli, the plume of flame seems to weaver, shrink, and stop! I grab her by the wrist and pick up the girl flavor and all and drag her from the inferno. The makeshift contraption is leaking fuel. We need to get out of here before we're both al put alive. <laughs> Michelli kicks and screams against me, and I can f begin to hear noises from the outside world. What the heck? The reality bubble has collapsed, and the house, house is still on fire. Bleating fire alarms are still screaming. We have gone from demon hunters to arsonists. We need to leave. I double down on my strength and drag Michelli from the house. I'm leaving now. If we get caught, we're both going to jail. You're coming or not? Michelli, her eyes now and furious, snarls at me. Wow. Why did you stop me? It was gone. You're burning down a house now. What if there were still people in there? Blame them. Nothing matters but killing that snake. Then aren't you technically the same as the snake? Michelli, let me tell you that, if you burn them down, if you burn down the people who are still residing in the house, then doesn't that make you technically the same as the snake, except for the fact that there is a case, and it's not the fact that they were removed from history, and that was right. I curse myself from speaking, but words slip out of my mouth. What did you say? The cherry stare freezes my heart in place. Veins bulge on her forehead and her mouth pulls back at the corners, revealing her teeth ever so slightly. Nothing. We need to get out of here. We need to kill that thing. I thought I could trust you. And I thought you would be a rational person. Someone's going to notice this fire soon and we need to be gone before they do. I'm leaving. Are you coming? As much as I'm terrified of Chay's animalistic expression, what we have done here is a crime exactly. In the real world, there is no history erasing here that would shield us from the consequences of burning down a house. Michelli stares at me, a breathing fast and shadow. I can see her nostrils flaring and chest rising in time. What would Max say to all this, huh? You no longer want to avenge him? I grit my teeth as she mentions Max's name. Of course I do, he's my best friend, but I doubt he'd want me to burn someone that, somebody's house in the process. The serpent is gone. Just get out of here, we should talk about this tomorrow. I leave the furious girl on the lawn of the glowing house. 
Black smoke is starting to bellow out of the windows. It will only be a moment before Solon looks outside and sees it exactly. If they get my number plate, then I'm a dead man. The key slides into the ignition and the engine clink sorry, cranks itself into life. But Chelly's terrible stare never once leaves me as I pull away. She needs to get out of there. If anyone sees her but that makeshift flame for her, she'll have no excuse. I only hope that she is sane enough to run from the scene of a crime. Stopping the serpent is priority number one. But that is impossible from within a jail so that cell, so yeah, that is exactly true. And if the only way to stop it from killing people is to sacrifice innocent people, then what is the point exactly? You're just being the same as the serpent itself. But my mom won't reach me. So my voice won't reach Michelle now. She's well beyond reason. When she calms down, we can think about discussing it again. As I drive away, I can see the yellow-orange glow of a burning house start to stain the sky in my rearview mirror. Part of me secretly hopes that Michelle didn't make it away in time that she gets caught and somehow d doesn't implicate me in the process. Fighting the serpent alone doesn't really appeal to me, but if Michele acts like this forever, it would be impossible. Somehow I managed to drag myself out of bed. I'm not used to this small amount of sleep. Combined with the stress and exertion of chasing the serpent, it's starting to make me feel groggy every morning. I guess you could call it a ghost hunting... <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, whatever, it doesn't matter. All I need to do is make it to school. I could probably find a place to nap if I look hard enough. If the school is okay with truancy, but it should be fine with someone catching some Z's. And I brew a pot of coffee. The dripping sound of the dripping liquid into the gas pot is loud in the morning. It doesn't take long for there to be enough for me, so I hurriedly pour a cup. I throw in an ice cube or two to take off the edge, then take a deep draught. Lukewarm caffeine strokes my whatever they are and starts my body ticking. I hope Machelli got away last night. There were sirens blaring all through the night. It must have been hell to a fire. <laughs> it must have been a hell of a fire, sorry. Anyway, what's done is done. We can't take that back. So long as no one saw us leaving the area, then we should be fine. Good morning, sleepyhead. I'd expect you to be here before me. Nat helps us sell some cereal and some orange juice from the fridge. Hi, should I pour you a cup? I'm fine with juice, thanks. She's yet to develop the unhealthy addiction to coffee that seems to fuel the rest of the family. Between mum's shift work, dad's late nights and my studies, the rest of us find it hard to make it through the day without some kind of energy help, even if it's only very temporary. But, but, but Natalia's still a kid. She doesn't know what it means to need coffee to even hold a conversation. She doesn't even know what it means to need it so that we can function on a day-to-day -day basis. More tea if that's your preference. I'm jealous of that. It won't be long and she'll be just like us. You know, there are adults out there that don't drink coffee. And all the power to them. And all the power to everyone who does drink coffee. The half dream from last night comes back to me and I suddenly feel grateful for her presence. But I am sure that she is going to say something. Nat is my anchor in reality, always there to catch me when I'm falling. I'm still not sure about the memories about Max's death, but maybe before reality overwrote itself and removed him from history, she's helped me yet again. Athena, gratitude and guilt washes over me, and I try to smile despite my fatigue. Yeah, well, you know, studying all that early bird gets a worm. Lying to her is painful, but so is telling the truth. I can see her scrutinizing me. I know she wants to say something, but she lets it slip away from her. You're right. At least, that's what I'm going to start telling myself. Nat sits across from me and whips out her phone, scrolling through it with her left hand as she shoves the seal with her right. She slurps some milk a little. I'm sure Mum would complain, but she hasn't joined us for breakfast in weeks. Most mornings, just Nat and I sit in silence. Like strangers on a train. You're not strangers, sir. <laughs> You're siblings. Before that alone stirs me into action. Let's get to it. Do you want to go to school together? I want to find some way to tell her that maybe she is right about Michelle. Maybe she knows some way to control her. Or at least some kinds of way that I can get her to listen to me. Love to. Can't though. Have an excursion today. Excursion? Where to? But damn, it's for geography. Water supplies and the like. Ah, Natalia is clearly distracted by her phone. Her usual purse has been clipped into short sentences. Oh, right. Have fun. 
I'll have to find some of the time to talk. Chances are I won't see Michelli until tonight anyway. He can wait. Oh my god! Oh, what have you done to your phone? I stare. So I start staring at Natia's sudden exclamation. What is it? What is it? No, it's not. It's just protect. No, it's 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 protects you. Why? It makes it look like it has it. Yeah, exactly. What is it? It looks like there was a fire downtown last night. It didn't take long for that news to break, and the people inside died. I swallow hard to prevent my packed heart bursting from my chest. Died? Here, look. I see. Let's see if we can read this. Tragedy struck Pirith as a house fire turned deadly overnight. Fire crews battled with a raging inferno throughout the night once the flames were extinguished. They proceeded inside to make a grisly discovery. The remains of two people thought to be inhabitants of a house were found inside. Obviously, there will be a full investigation into the cause of fire and why the occupants were unable to escape. Explained a weary Lieutenant Matheson of the Pair of Fire Brigade. This only serves to remind us everyone check your smoke alarms annually and if so and so. Great! The remains of two people! A full investigation! Chills run down from head to toe and I can't stop myself from sh shaking! Are you alright? Did you know them? No. The words somehow creep out by themselves. My brain is, my brain is frozen trying to process what happened. I scroll down inside to find a photo of a house surrounded by fire trucks discharging their hoses into the flaming building. There's no mistake. That is the house of Michelli where I were in last night. No, she's a murderer. Although we're an accomplice. Murderers. This wasn't how it was supposed to happen. I want to kill a beast so that no one else would need to lose anymore. And yet we ended up becoming killers ourselves. I lost a fight when my stomach and vomit starts to race towards my head. Yikes, I barely make it to the sink before the black coffee I drank a moment ago spawning down the drain. You okay? Natani jumps by and grabs my shoulders, patting my back extensively to help calm my stomach. Yeah, fine. You don't look fine. It's okay. Coffee didn't sit well with me at all. I try to hide my dry retching from her as I sit back down. Maybe you should skip school. Get some rest. Part of me agrees with her. I want to run as fast as I can for this town and everyone in it. Especially that manic Machetti. She should have listened to me. I told her that the reality bubble was collapsing around us, but she wouldn't stop. She just wouldn't stop. And now two people are dead, and we're going to be under suspicion. I don't want to go to jail for, for life. I'm supposed to live a comfortable life. Study hard. Get into some kind of university. Get a job. <laughs> okay. Find a wife, have some kids, a normal, what do you mean a normal boring life? Romantic, wholesome, all that kind of stuff. But because of that lizard and the maniac, I'm going to rot in jail. No, because of that maniac, because people won't believe you about an interdimensional lizard kind of divine serpent. A wasted life. I want to cry, but I can't let Michelli see me like, Natalia sorry, see me like that. It's not fair to her. I take a deep breath to settle my stomach, then look at her in the eyes. It's okay, I'm fine. I drank too much coffee on the empty stomach, is all. Well, look after yourself. I can't look after you today. Gotta run. We have to be there half an hour beforehand. Sure, sure. Natalia throws the unfinished cereal to the sink and chugs her orange juice. Well, see you after school. Thank you. She's brought my story, hook, line, and sinker. Are you sure about that one? Or maybe she's just putting some sort of facade in order to later on inform you of the situation. I guess she's happy about the excursion. Not even a sick brother could get her down. On the other hand, I need to be at school. If I start to act suspicious, then maybe the police will be on me quicker. The article didn't mention that they were treating it as arson yet. So maybe there's a chance that they won't work it out that it was us. Or maybe I should simply go to the cops directly and report the chili. Two birds with one stone. No, because then you would have to be somewhere within that area to be able to point it out that it was her. But also, why didn't you report the chili on the night that it happened if you knew about it? Maybe you could say that you're too tired and need to go to bed. No. The serpents cause enough damage. We need to stop it. We'll work out how to contain it or how to kill it. Then once that is done, I'll hand Michelli over to the police like the killer she is. Maybe they can get her the help she needs. 
maybe not. Either way, she won't be my problem anymore. We just need to kill that monster and be done with it. Or, I don't know, just be away from the chair because I think she is somehow symbiotically linked to that divine serpent. The school seems somewhat peaceful with Natalie's grade missing. It shouldn't make this much impact, but the school isn't too large, and groups tend to stick to their areas on the quadrangle. There are noticeable gaps where there should be students talking and playing. The science isn't helping to dull the roaring caffeine in my mind, though. I should have stopped the jelly. I could have but had I tried. Or tried to rescue the people that were inside, but I was too busy getting out of there to do anything about it. I know what she was aiming for, but now there are more deaths due to the serpent. We're supposed to save people, not kill them. Somewhere out there is someone who is going through the same pain that I did when Max was eaten. That hopeless, longing feeling that gnaws away at your stomach. Turn it in ways that you thought were impossible. The sense you are never going to be able to feel happy again and that the memories of that person will fade. That you'll forget their face, their voice, their everything. And then you'll probably wonder to yourself, did they even exist in the first place? After the last person left forgets you, did you even exist in the first place? It's a hard thought to process. But until that creature is gone from this town, this will continue. The means may or may not be justified by the end, but we've already come this far. To give up now would make every death pointless. That's why I'm here, sitting in the subdued schoolyard, pretending that everything is fine. I need to avoid raising any suspicions until the serpent is dead or gone, preferably either. After that, I'll wear my punishment. Of course, I prefer not to go to jail, but some things are more important than your own comfort. Who knows how many hundred people the serpent has erased from history? If I can at least remember Max, then I can also remember the others. I know, so I might not know who they were, but if I can remember Max for as long as I live, then I feel that I'm remembering them all, at least in part. I took a deep breath to calm my nerves. There is not much I can do here at school. I decided to head to the library. Maybe I can look into the legends of the Rainbow Serpent. Maybe I can find a clue there. Saint will help us fight it for real. Mache seems to be at least on the right path. The fire did get some kind of reaction from the beast. Maybe we need to contain it somehow. Trap it so it can we can burn it hard. A trapeze out to the library, my soul heavy, but with my head still in control. Gotta keep it cool and make it look like nothing is going on. There's still a chance that no one saw us at the house that burned down, and that they'll never find us. After all, the people that died there didn't exist until last night. There's nothing that connects Mature and I to the crime, except for the fact that you were there, but somebody just needs to capture evidence of you being there. The school's library is even more sedate than the yard. I guess not many people use physics books anymore. There's a kid using one of the computers in the corner, but apart from that, it's a ghost town. I tried googling the serpent before, but there wasn't much online. For this, I think I really need to hit the books. The Aboriginal History section in the library is laughably small. But then again, it's more detailed than Wikipedia articles. Wikipedia is where you're going wrong. You won't find things on Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a reference of references. Maybe I'm misleading and that it's a good place to start but not a good place to end. I pull out a book about the dream time and start flickering through the pages. Dot paintings from ancient caves stare back at me. As the dry text goes over the tales that I recall from my history classes, the Rainbow Serpent was one of the dream time creatures that carved rivers into the landscape of Australia. Every tribe has their own dream time stories. And yet the Rainbow Serpent seems to show up in all of them. The story changes depending on the part of the country. Around here, it's decided to hide itself and become an island somewhere offshore, never to be heard of again. Unfortunately, none of this is going to help me. None of the stories seem to have any information about fighting the beast. Maybe I need to speak to William. I consider skipping out from school, but it will have to wait. I need to avoid drawing attention to myself. Today. And tomorrow. Every day, until I'm either arrested or until the serpent is neutralized. Until then...
Hmm. Douglas Lovelet. Report to the principal's office. The PA message shakes open, shakes me to my core. <laughs> I feel my heart start to raise and sweat well up in my pores. I thought I was ready to accept my punishment, but I'm not. My throat closes and I feel myself gasping for breath. I know that I need to calm down, but I can't manage to get a hold of myself. Visions are being dragged away and a cop car flash before me. My mother in tears. My father's disappointed face. Life that I never knew. My brain screams to me to run, but my body instinctively follows the instructions from a disembodied voice. I stand up and walk haltingly to towards the principal's office. Okay. Let's see what's going on here at the principal's office. I rap lightly on the door and the principal, a sh ashen face, beckons me into her office. Douglas, I... I don't see any police. And there's something about her face, her expression. My nerves might be getting the better of me, but something is wrong. Instincts are screaming at me in a confusing chorus. I don't know if I should run or sit. Please, sit down. I have some... Some bad news. Oh no, is this about Natalie? This, but that means I sit down. There's been an accident. At the dam! Her words are drowned out by my heartbeat, now deafening my ears. Nat, is Nat okay? Your parents will pick you up from here and take you to the hospital. My body is trembling, I feel weak. Is Nat okay? Is my sister okay? I don't realize it, but I'm screaming. The principal doesn't answer, but her face tells me the answer. She'll be okay, right? Right? I'm sorry, but your parents will be here soon. They should be the ones to tell you. The scent of disinfectant. The bustle of people shuffling around the waiting room. That damned, incessant beeping. Why isn't anyone talking to us? I'm still shaking. Dad picked me up from school in a taxi. He was white as a ghost and sighed the whole time. I wonder why. I don't think he could speak even if he t tried. Mum was already at the hospital when the accident occurred. But since she was a relative, they wouldn't let her in. An orderly showed us to the waiting room. And I could tell from her face that it wasn't good news. So I began to piece together some of the story. The year nine class had gone to the dam for their field trip. So it must have happened to the dam itself. It was a standard thing at our school. You know about hydropower and the water cycle. But somehow, Natalia had gone beyond a barrier and fallen. She was airlifted out by a helicopter and we were all dragged here in a rush. But it's been an hour now, we haven't heard anything. Mom is furious. Every five minutes she storms up to the nurse station demanding answers. To their credit, her colleagues don't buckle. Frustrated, she gives up and returns to her plastic waiting room chair. I nod my nails down as fast as I could. Blood leaks around their ragged edges. God damn. Dad hasn't moved since he sat down. He's literally petrified of what comes next. I can't believe what is happening. Either at this point, we all know in our hearts what the result will be. Part of me expects a surgeon in tethered scrubs to come out bursting through the door at any moment and beam at us telling us that we can see her, and that Nat will be lying on a hospital bed, bruised and sporting a drip, but smiling faintly back at us. I want that so bad, but my heart is filled with doubt. And you have every right to have heart doubt in your heart, because this kind of scenario is so bad. Like she fell off a barrier, and who knows how deep that fell down into, or well, how far down that was until she reached the bottom of the barrier. Or the bottom of beyond the barrier. Every time the door swings open, my mind, my head snaps around like a meerkat, desperate for some news. And yet, when the news comes, I didn't even hear the operating theater's door open. Oh, sheesh. He hasn't said a word, but his stance, his face, his eyes. His eyes tell me everything I need to know. Mum collapsed on the spot before he could even open his, her mouth. Dad doesn't react. He's a statue, incapable of thought. I'm... I'm sorry. Damn. Just this morning she was beaming at us, and now she's no longer with us. My knees go weak. Even sitting down I can feel that my joints won't support me, so I stay put. Mom begins to wail. 
but duty nurse rushes to her, but mom pushes her away. She stumbles away, her cries fading only barely as she disappears from my sight. We tried everything, but it was too late. Dad stands, shakes the surgeon's hand, and walks out of a waiting room without once opening his mouth. My mind is racing, trying to think of a way out of this. It can't be real. We were talking at breakfast. She seemed just as happy as ever. She's... dead? The surgeon nods grimly. I'm afraid that the fall was unsurvivable. It was too deep. I shouldn't have asked. If you didn't confirm it, then maybe I didn't have to- No, it's better that you did know. Otherwise, you would always have in your head about what if. But like Scrongida's cat, I've opened the box. Until I've asked, there's a slim chance that she was alive. By asking the question, I feel like I've sealed her fate. My mind goes blank. I can't think. It's like my brain is stored. Permanently. Then one by one, images start to come into my mind. Watching her graduate from high school, catching up at New Year's because we were going to different universities, Nat at her wedding day, me looking after her kids for an afternoon, my stomach turns at the waste of life, the things we won't get to do together. Before I know it, my mouth is moving. How? How did it happen? The surgeon sits on the seat next to me, putting his arm around me. We're not sure why, but she had crossed the barrier. She fell down the face of the dam. Chills raced down my spine. All I can imagine was how afraid she would have been as she tumbled through the air. Thank you very much for doing everything you could, surgeon. We know that you wanted to do absolutely everything you can to save my sister's life. Thank you. The pain of impacting with the dam well on my, on the way down. How lonely she must have been lying a crumbled heap at the bottom of a concrete structure. But my question is, did she intentionally go over the barrier herself, or was she pushed there? Was she convinced to go there somehow by someone? I'll let... Michele. I'll let out an involuntary gasp as I replay the ordeal again and again in my head. She would have lost consciousness straight away. There would have been no pain. I know that he's trying to comfort me, as an emergency surgeon he must have had to break the news to other family members in the past. And I don't think, I don't think, that no matter how many times these nurses and doctors and surgeons have had to break the news, there isn't a, there isn't, let me try and rationalize my emotions here, but each time they have to announce it, it is never any less dark it could be true uh, why would he lie or well, he might be lying either way his words provide a small blanket of comfort here take this he hands me a handkerchief i didn't realize it but tears have been pouring down my cheeks thanks i dab away the tears my body running on autopilot let me get someone to call a cab for your family it's best that you all go home and stick together the hospital's counsellor will be in touch with your mother. If you have any questions, you can call them. Thanks. The surgeon pats me on the back reassuringly, but I barely register the gesture. Images of Natalia trembling like a rag doll over the edge of a dam replay constantly in my mind. I shudder as I feel the impacts as if it were my own body, and I can't get her face out of my mind. Her smile, her laugh, her worries, all gone. And for what? Just what was the purpose of her life? To be squandered like this? Max, if you're out there, I could really use a friend right now. You rain? What? Max, clear as day, is sitting beside me in the waiting room. You look bummed. What happened? Natalia, she's dead. Like you. Oh, that sucks. You alright, bro? Alright. My best friend and my sister are dead. How the blank am I supposed to be alright? Well, okay, dude, chill. Just time to lighten the mood. Sorry, I'm kind of stressed right now. I can imagine. How are your parents? Why are you giving that cheeky grin? They're both broken in their own ways. I don't think they can handle this. And you? I just can't stop thinking about how scared she must have been. Lonely and scared. If they brought her here... 
she must have been showing some signs of life, and none of us were here for her. She died without any of us being able to do anything for her. But the question is, what can you do for her? Damn, that's dark. You don't seem okay at all. I don't know what I am right now. Oh, I know one thing, and that's that you need to get out of here. Hospitals give off bad vibes, and your mom looks like she needs some help. I pull myself out of my own head long enough to look at my mother, who is still sobbing on the floor. Her colleagues are giving her some distance, watching with respect and remorseful faces. Somehow I manage to drag myself to my feet and walk over to her. Mom, I'm sorry. She doesn't say anything clutches my legs. I can feel her body shift as she tries to calm herself with deep breaths. Slowly she stands up, using my body to steady hers. I can only imagine what she's thinking. After working in the emergency ward for more than two decades, she must have seen her fair share of trauma, but now it's personal. Like she's had to tell the remaining victims of said accidents or tragedies. But now she's on the receiving end of that tragedy. Her only daughter's been taken away. Let's go home. She nods at me, and I wrap my arms around her waist. Wrist, sorry. We support each other towards the door and to the taxi waiting beyond. How many times do I have to tell you it's not your fault? Not for me, not for Natalia. There was nothing you could do. I know he's trying to make me feel better, but I'm simply not in the mood. I only want to lie on my bed until sleep finally comes to me. Dad vanished almost as soon as we got home. I have no idea where he went. I can only be imagine that the drinking will only get heavier from here. Mom opened herself a bottle of wine, drinking it alone on the kitchen table with her tears. I can't bear to talk to either of them. I don't even know what I'd say. I know I should say so, but words are knotted in my throat. I don't think I could speak without breaking into tears. None of us had had the courage to go into Natalia's room yet. It simply doesn't feel real. Every scuffle from the kitchen makes me think that she's come home, and this is just a bad dream. But it's not a dream, is it? This is as real as it gets, my friend. I know. I know. But it shouldn't be like this. Then what should it be like? I don't know. But anything other than this, you, Natalia, you should both be here. Just every the way it was. Maybe you flirted with her or something. <laughs> Max leans back on my desk chair, his hands clasped around the back of his head. It pees me off he could be so relaxed about this. Of course I'm relaxed, but there's literally nothing that could hurt me, hurt me now, so. Unless you get a lobotomy. Wow. Please don't get a lobotomy. I twist away from the figure trying to hide Max's vestige from my sight, but he is there, next to me in my bed. Dude, you can't get rid of me. I'm here now. Talk to me, okay? Fine. What do you want? I want you to know that it's not your fault. That there's nothing you could have done. And that there's nothing that you can do. The pain will subside when you learn to let go. I close my eyes and try to ignore the phantom. I don't want the pain to subside. I don't want to forget. No, you don't want to forget, yes, but you want the pain to subside somehow. I don't want to give up. I jump up with a start, but it was a real noise. Not a clean from, of mom's glass or a phantasm in my bed. My eyes snap open and focus on my room's tiny windows. You? What are you doing here? I don't want to see anyone now, least of all Michelli. I contemplate locking the windows and ignoring her, but maybe the company would do me good. I look around the room, Max is nowhere to be seen. With us, I throw the, ca the catch on the window, Michelli lets herself in. Thanks, it's cold out there. Sure. My voice is barely above a whisper. Michelli takes a moment to start the conversation and wonder if she maybe came here looking for consolation as well. She, she always spoke highly of Nat. She obviously knows at least about the accident. So... What's our plan for tonight? I figure we'd best discuss beforehand. 
but no. Michelle only has eyes of a serpent. I should have known that. She really is mad, isn't she? I'm not in the mood. Mood? Mood? Mood has nothing to do with this. We have a monster to kill. You and I, we're supposed to be a team, inseparable. We're supposed to kill that thing together, right? I... I just can't tonight. I can't stop thinking about anything that's happened. And whose fault is that? Mine? No, it's the serpent. The serpent did all this. We need to kill that blank right now. But I need your help to do that. You can't kill it. We can't kill it. It's pointless. We should let it eat us and be done with it. Michelle backhand burns across my cheek. Can you even hear yourself? You're not that kind of person, Doug. You don't give up. I know it. What the blank do you know about me? I know that you want to see this blank dead. You don't think I know about loss? I never let that stop me. Sure, it sucks about Nat, but now it's just you and me against this thing. That hasn't changed. Have you had any siblings to mourn over? We need to make it pay for what it's done. You and I, together. She changed her tone and looks at me sheepishly. This is not about the serpent anymore. Don't you want that? What did you say? Mache sits down on the bed, leaning backwards and drawing me towards her. Confused to let myself follow out her out of instinct. Okay, don't be too minded or too congested in thought. Part of me yearns to be held right now for some human contact to remind me I'm still alive. Just you and me. No. No thanks. I'm not reading that. <laughs> oh dear. My consciousness starts to rearrange itself as cold realization courses across my skin. I don't want to think about Natalia anymore. I mean, I want to remember her, but I need a distraction. I can't shape the image of her trembling down that dam, no matter how, my hard, how hard I try. I don't feel like drinking, but a certain rage begins to boil in my belly. That lizard took Max from me, and probably Natalia as well. I need to make it pay. Machete lets go of me, her face flush and gaze slightly muddied. We need to kill this thing, the sooner the better. She's right, you know. Max reappears at the corner of my vision. I try to focus on him, but I can't. You can't change the past. It's set in stone. Once something has happened, it's happened. But you can get revenge. Kill that serpent. Avenge me! <sighs> I'm trapped. There's no way backwards. No path to the side. I'm locked on this course of action. If I give up now, all of those who have died will be in vain. Killing the serpent won't bring that back. Or Max. I know, but, but it will at least prevent anyone else from having that same torment. But for now, I need an ally. Even if she is an arsonist. My mind is made up. There will be time for grief later. For now, it's time for action. Let's kill this blind together. But hey, smiles shrine for him pulls me closer again. Gosh darn it. Oh dear. The town below me has never looked so inviting. Michelle is sitting silently on the car's hood, her equipment weighing heavy in the car's boot. Every now and again, but a tear starts to roll from my eye. I pretend I have allergies so as to not to tip off Michelle. The last thing I want is her sympathy, or pity, or for her to hound me down. That's of course under an assumption that she's ever it's like even capable of such things, which I doubt. It became painfully clear that Machetti's complete Machetti's completely stuck. She won't move on unless the serpent is dead. That suits me just fine right now. That's so if there's nothing else I want or need. We're going to find this monster, stop it. Somehow, we'll stop it. There! Machetti's shrill voice pierces the blanket of silence. I follow her outstretched finger and, she, and see the serpent's aura streaming out of a nearby house. And here we go. My only reply is to fire up the engine and speed towards the light as Machete leaps into the passenger seat. And I throw caution to the wind. If we get pulled over and the flame thrown, the boot is enough to implicate us both. Exactly. If we crash, but I'm going to sit here until I burn, that would be a fitting end to all this. Don't be so hard on yourself. I ignore the fans and I don't need my chelly getting involved in this. After all, this is a monster that deletes people from history. What kind of chance do you stand against something like that? 
one will move and go up. Everything you ever done is unwound. You've gone forever, like you never existed. I'll show you the cards beside the chain leans against the seatbelt. Max, however, stays put. His head between the driver and passion seat smug as ever. I get it, I was only trying to help. Gosh damn it, help, Max. Could you help me by not being there, please? The phantom disappears. And once again, there are only two of us in the car. We round the last corner in the small residential street and are greeted by the flashing corner cupia of colors from the house in front of us. Let's get this son of a blank. You got it, partner. She leaves from the car and strips on her flame for her, leaving a large satchel behind. Take that with you. What's this? Just bring it. We well, I left the sack from the car. So I lift the sack from the car. I'm surprised she was a even able to carry it. It is incredibly heavy and smells of fuel. No. There's no way I'm going to carry this to the house. I'll leave a package on the curb and chase off the machete who is already inside the surface bubble. And again, we have this flamethrower sort of thing. The orange bursts from her flamethrower partially to drown out the softer blues and greens from the serpent. I wish I decided to find Machete even more unhinged than before. Did you bring the bomb? Bomb? The bomb from the car. Are you insane? Haven't you done enough damage? You killed two people already with your stupid flamethrower. Are you kidding me? I didn't think you were this week. We won't get anywhere if you let your consent stop you every single time. You either give it your all or an act or nothing changes. There's no room for hesitation, Doug. Her words make sense, but I still can't take a risk this big. There's no point in killing that monster if we need to destroy the city while doing it. But to Mache, this doesn't matter. For her, only the monster exists. Everything else is simply an NPC in her grand crusade. <laughs> yeah, NPC. I just shake my head. That's why I saved you from the serpent the first time. I saw a fighter. I fought that with you. We stood a chance. The chain lets out some blast from her weapon and the serpent retreats from a wall. Leave me alone with her. I should have realized that time would dampen that passion. No, what is she saying? It was Nat who nursed me after Max died. I remember that. I remember her worried face about my head. My throat tightens again when I realize I can no longer ask her about it. But on the other hand, I don't even feel the need to. I'm certain that Michelle is lying. She's trying to win me over with lies. That's a lie. It was Nat who saved me that night. I remember that. You won't fool me. It came out like a hiss and Michelle opens her mouth shocked. Say what? You only wanted to use me, didn't you? You're incapable of feeling any of anything except the hate of that stupid monster. That's all you are. What else did you lie about? That story about your uncle and aunt? The lonesome patrols every night since then? Was that a lie as well? I never lied to you, dumbass. And the fact that you knew, Max, that he helped you with your writing? Frenzy just a moment ago, but Cherry freezes at those words. So it was true, she did lie to me. Told me what I wanted to hear to pull me closer and then use me. His hair. What color was it? Are you nuts? I don't have time for a quiz. Is it so hard? It's just one word. You remember him, don't you? Spit it out. I already know the truth. She has no idea who Max even is. Her nervousness now is obvious and painful to watch. And as much as I hate to admit it, realizing that my only honor has become a, has become a traitor is excruciating. Fine, black, it was black. <laughs> nope. How do I let her deceive me so? Did I need someone to talk to that desperately? Maybe I really am weak. It wasn't black. Nat was right. You're a liar and a psychopath. I felt bad for you for your tragic past. I felt connected because you remembered my friend. But those were just illusions you created to use me. I wish you'd have listened to Nat. I'm such an idiot. But fine, I lied about Max, but I just want you to feel better. There's nothing wrong with my intentions. I never... You killed innocent people in their sleep, Machete. You're no different than that monster. Did she tell you that? She put those ideas into your head, didn't she? Ha! <laughs> Good riddance, then. What do you say? You heard me. Natalia? She was constantly getting between us. Bad influence, my ass. We only have one job. Everything else is a distraction. 
My body reacts before my mind can catch up, and I grab Machete's thin arms, shaking her. What have you done to her? But she doesn't flinch. She only stares at me with glow glowing eyes, yeah. I didn't know you were so attracted to your own- She's my sister, you ass! This is a war. Everyone loses someone. Get over it. The only thing she did was to divert you from our goal. Maybe that she's gone, you finally realize what's important. Open your eyes, Doug. Open my eyes, not being a distraction. Give me a break. You're just crazy. She saved me time and time again. Without her, I... Machete frees herself from my weakened grip. I don't know what to think anymore. But before I can react, the serpent's head bursts through a wall, charging at the girl. She reacts immediately and turns to intercept the monster. A gout of flame erupts from her weapon and the serpent dodges upwards, barring into the ceiling. Its liquid body courses like a gleaming pipe between wall and ceiling. Machete coats and in its flames as it passes. The sound of boiling water sizzles in the enclosed space, but the serpent seems to take no damage. Steam fills the room, reflecting the fire's fierce glow. The serpent disappears down the hall, and Machete chases after it. Turbulent emotion strain in my head. Was the accident a damn real really accident? I think she did. Of course she would. She didn't even bat an eyelid when she found out she killed those people in her house. And who am I kidding? She practically admits to doing it herself. I can't let this go on. You seem like you need a friend about now. Man, so Max's phantom appears among the flames. I don't have time for your stuff, Max. She's not going to surrender, you know. Go away. I'm just saying. What do you really want to do? I want to kill her. To wrap my hands around her throat and squeeze a life from her. Then why don't you? No one would notice. If you let her here. So you left her here, she would burn with the house. You'd be off the hook for the arson. And she'd be dead. What difference would it make? You can't do it, can you? You can't bring yourself to kill someone no matter how much you hate them. I want to fight with Max and prove him wrong, but she's right. After so much death, I don't think I want to see another body, let alone one born of my own hands. I knew it. But you know, there might be another way. Max as the vestige flickers and dissolves into the flames, which began to rage in their intensity. Of course she would. Mache charges back into the hall, her weapon bleaching orange flames again. <laughs> This contraption and her. Make yourself useful and bring me that bomb. Blank you. I was wrong to trust you. I should have never trusted anyone. A sleeming head slowly appears behind the raging girl. And she dodges the attack. She dodges the attack and returns fire with her flamethrower. The serpent's red eyes begin to glow, and rows of teeth quiver in anticipation. My mind races. Uh, if a serpent devours Mache, then she'll be removed from history. Poof, gone, forever. Past, future, and. Sorry, present, future, and past. Everything she's done will be rewritten. I never have met her. We'd have never started chasing this monster. No flamethrowers, no innocent victims, no accident at the dam. It's okay, save Natalia. I'll be fine like this. Revenge never solves anything anyway. My mind is made up, and my body begins to act. I rush forward, tackling Matelli towards the serpent. As I connect, I can see her eyes widen in shock. And there she is. The serpent reacts instantly, curling itself around Matelli's slender body, trapping her in a coil of pulsating phantom energy. Wow. Its head cranes up and, only, sorry, and over her, swaying gently as it positions itself for the strike. The jay tries to struggle but can't extricate herself from the serpent's embrace. Karma serves you right, fool. What are you doing? You killed my sister. You murdered those people in that house. I'd rather die myself and help you destroy even more. You fool, this snake will kill us all. Maybe, but at least I'll be rid of you. Blank you. Blank you, and when I get out of this, I'm going to raise this city to the ground. I notice a change in the pitch of the serpent's gurgling. It draws down until its eyes eye with Michele. 
its red eye meets with a chase furiously bloodshot eyes and for a moment it's like they are communicating. Machete's fury reaches a peak and she managed to free an arm from the serpent's body, slapping forward and connecting it with one of its eyes. The snake recoils and launches itself into the scene, releasing Machete from its grip. I can already feel the reality bubble starting to collapse around me. Inexplicably, Machete is still alive. Alive and furious. She reaches for her flame for her toggles to trigger, but the device only lets out a, a faint hiss. It was destroyed by the serpent's crushing grip. And MJ throws the useless device to the ground and screams. Of course she would. Oh dear. <laughs> you traitor! You'll pay for this, you'll all pay! Mache storms past me, shoving me against the wall as she does. And I want to stop her, but I can't. My knees are weak and my throat tight. My entire energy reserve has been sapped from me. Instead of chasing her, I fall to my knees. Tears I've been suppressing since Maxis's demise f flow freely from my eyes. Here on some stranger's floor, I find myself unable to move, sobbing like a baby. I've lost. We've lost. We never had a chance to defeat this monster. And now it's taking everything from me. I just want to lie here until it comes to consume me and remove me from this wretched life. Come on, you blanker. What are you waiting for? I know you want me gone, so come and finish me off. But I know that I'm not that lucky. If I don't want Machete, then it won't want me either. We're both cursed somehow. We're not part of a serpent's grand plans. After who knows how long, I managed to crawl inside the house and back into to my... Crawl outside the house and back to my father's car. Machete's remaining equipment is gone, but the car remains. Defeat washes over me. I sit in the driver's seat, afraid to turn the key. I don't know how I can face my parents, let alone myself. Maybe I'd be better off dead. Damn. Damn and blast for all this. This is all your fault, Natalie. You're the one who killed her. But of course, you don't care. You don't care about anything other than yourself, Nat Michelli, sorry. Oh, I keep mixing up the names. Probably because they ended in the last name. Lesser, sorry. I wish it was it were raining. Until today, I always imagined that funerals only took place in the rain. But instead, the sun is shining bright. And the cool spring breeze comfortably wafts between the assembled onlookers. I see a sad face in their best clothes. Soft sobs from children who aren't yet capable of understanding what has happened. Mournful adults shaking their heads and repeating platitudes about how it was about how it was a life taken too early. And here I am, waiting silently for the hearse to arrive. Dad stands next to me. Dutifully shaking his hands with everyone and it comes to offer condolences. He thanks them, but I know what he's thinking. He would give all he had to be anywhere else in the world. Mum is trying to contain herself, but her constant sniffing tells the truth of the matter. People from my class and school stand around nervously, not knowing what to say to me. They roll out the tropes they've seen on TV. I'm sorry for your loss. She was taken before her time. If there's anything I could do, Sweet nothing said in a time of crisis. And me? I'm furious. Furious that Machete put me here. Furious that I was powerless to stop her. And that she's on the, now on the loose, probably making someone else's life hell. Furious at the serpent for throwing me in the situation. If only I didn't leave my phone at Max's house at night and let the serpent go about its business. I would have been as careless as the rest of the people gathered here today. But I'm not. Everyone else thinks about today as the end of the tragic, of a tragic accident, so. But I know the truth, and I can't tell anyone. Natia was murdered in cold blood. Murdered so that a psychopath could chase ghosts. There is suddenly a shift in the crowd, and I look towards the cemetery gates. The unmistakable shape of the hearse is winding its way towards the chapel. My heart stops. I thought I was ready for this, but I'm not. I want to run. Run right to the rolling field of green dotted with green he so grey headstones. But I stand fast. This isn't my day. It's Nat's. One more goodbye before the dark night. I take a deep breath and try to remember what the funeral director told us. The hearse will arrive here, and they'll move the casket onto a trolley. The crowd will have a chance to write their last farewells onto the outside. Then we will carry her into the chapel. 
Mom opted for cremation. She couldn't bear the thought of her, sorry, of her only daughter rotting away in the ground. We'll all say a few words and then that will be it. I subconsciously feel for the po folded paper in my jacket pocket. Paper in my jacket pocket, sorry. I tried to write some words down last night, but I couldn't think of anything that seemed nerve what seemed worthy of the occasion. It was too much pressure. How are you supposed to say goodbye to someone that you've already always known? I secretly hope that the hearse never arrives and I don't have to speak. But my wishes can't stop time. The hearse is soon upon us, slowing as the crowd parts to let it through. The rumbling engine stops and for a moment there is no sound in the cemetery. A few sniffles break the tension and the undertakers alight from the vehicle, suddenly opening the back door to reveal the tiny white coffin. It's smaller than I imagined. I can't picture Nat crumbled inside, but thankfully I don't have to see that. The undertaker skillfully removed the casket and placed it onto a wheeled trolley and positioned Nat at the door of the chapel. Ladies and gentlemen, before the service, the family would like to invite you to write a farewell message onto the coffin. There are markers available here. We will begin in 15 minutes. Hearing such a loud voice after the whispers of the crowd is a bit of a shock to me. The funeral director then passes a marker to my father, who pauses for a moment before scribbling on the white vena of the coffin. His writing is barely legible, which is of no surprise. He passes the marker to my mother, but he places a hand on the coffin, his chest heaving as he tries to maintain his composure. Mom scrolls, wait for me, on the side of the coffin and passes the marker to me. I can't think of what to write. My emotions are too turbulent to be coherent. I quickly scribble, love you always little sister, and hand the pen to the next person waiting. That's better than nothing. And also that is definitely what you'd call a very heartwarming message to put on to a morbid occasion. As we step back, the crowd descends onto the coffin. As soon the white, sorry, and soon the white surface is a colorful montage of farewells, in-jokes and doodles. Some of her friends laugh through tears as they write secret messages that only they would understand. I want to yell at them. To stop them desecrating my sister, but mum holds me back. Everyone grieves in their own way. They do indeed. Everyone does. You don't have a monopoly on your sister, exactly. I let my shoulders sag and scan the crowd. Almost everyone from Nat's class is here. Save one obvious exception, yet, yeah, uh, Michelli. I'm not sure how I'd react if Michelli showed her face here, but I'm pretty sure I wouldn't let her leave alive. I take a nervous breath and decide to focus on the task at hand. Some of the older relatives have already started to file inside the small chapel and take their seats. There clearly aren't enough seats for everyone. I guess that is an advantage of dying young. You still have enough friends to pick out a f pack out a funeral. I remember when my grandmother died, and apart from us, the only other guests were residents of her nursing home. They were bustled in. A service provided by the home so that no one was alone at their final goodbye. In the end, death comes for us all, in one way or another. The crowd outside begins to thin, and the pale bearers, pearl bearers take up their position. Some of these words i never heard of before. I stand opposite Dad, his face contorted by pain and grief. Clearly he doesn't want to do this. Okay, we're going to lift on three. One, two, three. We clumsily lift the heavy coffin up onto the shoulders and the undertakers, sorry, undertakers remove the trolley. With the coffin against my face, I can read more of the messages. I avert my eyes. I don't want to feel anything anymore. But the messages seep into my brain, and I realize how little I knew about my sister, her friends, her dreams. I'm overcome with the desire to simply sit with her for hours to ask about her world. But now, I'll never get the chance. Gentlemen, let's proceed. We start to shuffle together, letting the weight of the coffin settle into our shoulders. The ground shakes as we take our first steps. I'm not sure if I imagine that or not. We quickly settle into a rhythm as we move into the chapel. The crowd stands and turns to face us. 
A thunderclap rolls harmlessly over the cloudless sky. I try to ignore the weight I'm lifting and the leering faces, the rising bar in my stomach. It feels like the earth is shifting under my feet. The sounds around me fall, so, filter through my head, bypassing me. The whimpering and sniffles of the crowd. The dirge playing over the, ch the chapel's sound system and a distant sh swell of water. Suddenly, a klaxon cuts through the solemnity of the service. I look to the funeral director leading the procession. Procession? What was that? Uh, he turns to look back towards us, thunder and slushy rising in crescendo, and the funeral director's jaw drops in shock. What the? Sound crashes down. Oh. Historia Chapter 1 by Luce Day 96. Wow. So, that was the first chapter of this game then. And actually, on that note, it's a good time to end this video off, but not before we go through the credits. And what a outcome that was. Like, honestly... Like, it just turned from one tragedy to another, from from being murderers to losing our sibling to this funeral, and now whatever awaits after this. Now, this, if there wasn't a chapter two, I would be really, like, sitting on my seat wanting a chapter two in order to um, find out what's going on next. The dam itself. Okay, someone give me a sit rep now. Sir, the dam burst around mid-afternoon. We didn't start getting reports until the flooding reached Windsor. They thought it was a normal flood, but right, so the river rose much faster than ever before. We managed to evacuate most of them, but here, the fire chief turns to survey the flooded dam behind them. Turbulent flows of water throw up a light fog around the area, making it hard to see. Here they had no chance. It would have been like a tidal wave. Any idea of what we're looking at? The police sent their chopper up, but they couldn't see anything. We had teams up and down the river all night looking for anyone that might have been left. The whole valley is flooded. It would take weeks for water to subside, let alone assess the damage. So the whole town? A fire chief removes his helmet, averting his eyes from the commander's gaze. <laughs> How many? Hard to say, but early estimates are over 20,000. The entire floodplain was gone in a flash. We didn't even get a call. Debris and bodies are washing up all the way to the coast. It's a nightmare. Nate sorry, Michelli did this. She blew up the dam. And the press? We're keeping them away. They know, of course, but we don't want them to see. There's no point in that. Their helicopters will have more than our guys by now. We'll see more than our guys by now. But keep them away from here. What about the hospital? The fire chief simply shakes his head. Damn it. So all we could do is wait. Until the water subsides, yes. Look how fast that flow is. One step in that mess and you're gone. Right. Make sure there is an exclusion zone. And around the flow. And get a camera crew up here. Post some pictures as soon as you can. I don't want anyone else dying trying to get an Instagram photo. Sir. We found someone. The assembled team jumps as if shocked by electricity. An unexpected survivor amongst the chaos. Years of trains snap into place, displacing the whole of the disaster before them. They part to let the gurney pass through their ranks before converging behind it. Multiple teams jump into action. There's a lot of subtle visual um, like effects in the background. I really like that about this game. An ambulance is brought up to the fore throwing the doors wide open. Breathe them here! Are they conscious? Barely, she was tr stumbling around beside the flood water. She seems dazed. It's shock. Let me see her. You! Can you hear me? The small figure can only stare off into the distance, but her blinking shows that there's at least some sign of life. You blew up the dam and you failed to get away! You're safe now. <coughs> Can you tell us your name? The figure shakes gently, unable to speak. Get her in the ambulance. Have a look at her. 
The paramedic guides a small figure on the gurney towards the, am the ambulance. Gurney, let's get this off you now. It's warm in here. The paramedic removes her jacket, placing it at the end of the gurney. Looks like you've had a rough day. Do you want to talk about it? I've done it. Done it? I saved them. What do you mean you saved them all? Saved who? Are there others? Sir, there might be others. You're not thinking through clearly. This is another mean of saving them all. But it's like she thinks that she saved everyone by letting the river not be there anymore. You blew up the dam in the hopes of saving everyone. That's what's happened here. And the police, the fire brigade, and the ambulance won't be number wise to know the truth. Michelli blew up the dam. Everyone, form up and start a search. There might be others. I saved them from that monster. Okay, darling, lie down. You're safe now. We're all safe now. Because I saved us all. Shut up, Michelli! We're losing her. Someone help me in here. No. The monster's still gargling. And in some ways, she is probably now the monster. Because the, the serpent must have relied on that water in order to actually survive when it wasn't hunting people at night. So I think this menu here is symbolic that the beast has consumed her and also consumed her physicality as well. Because if you let something overtake you psychologically so much that it completely consumes you and your ability to have rational thoughts, then you have become a part of it. And in this way, the gnawing teeth, the blood dripping down, that right there on the screen is Michelli, and the beast consuming her head, like without the teeth, is a beast that's consuming her psychologically, but with the teeth, it's also consuming her physically. So in this regard, chapter two, I think, is going to be some kind of introduction to the beast consuming her in a new way like it could be the fact that she is one with the beast itself and maybe she didn't even tell us that from the very beginning of the game like she is essentially the beast itself because she has allowed this beast to consume her so much that she is doing the same things that the beast has been or doing i'm gonna end off here thank you so much for watching the next time we'll be looking through chapter two of this game Thank you all so much for watching, and as always, folks, take care of yourselves. If you have any theories about this game, then please, by all means, put them down in the comment section below. Or just anything in the comment section below, really. Thank you so much for watching, and take care of yourselves.